Hello, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, wherever you might be joining us from. Um, my name is Nargis Farzad and I uh, look after matters Persian at SOAS, but tonight I'm here in my capacity as the chair of uh, Center for Iranian Studies and my partner in crime uh, for organizing the uh, Modern Middle East Lecture Series on Tuesdays is Dr. Dina Matar, the Chair of Center for Palestine Studies, who you would have seen taking turns in chairing this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, and we are doubly delighted uh, to have one of our own very special, illustrious alumni joining us to give the talk this evening. It's an absolute pleasure on many fronts to have um, uh, uh, to have Dr. Uh, Hura Al Hassan join us uh, because Hura, if I may call you Hura, Hura John rather than Dr. Al Hassan, of course you may. <laughs> thank you. To uh, she completed her postgraduate taught in a master's studies at SOAS and um, uh, abandoned us uh, in favor of the University of Cambridge where she completed her PhD there. And she's um, a research associate of the Center for Islamic Studies at Cambridge. Uh, but the reason we are here tonight is to see the depth and the passion with which Hura approaches study of literature in many guises. Just before you joined us online, Hura and I were talking and I'm delighted to discover that her passion, her research is now veering closer to my homeland and she is going to look comparatively at some Persian poetry. But the topic of tonight is Hura's book, which is um, entitled, I'm sure you looked at uh, the title of the talk, Women Writing and the Iraqi Ba'athist States. It all seems from such a long ago, but a period uh, whose um, uh, approach and uh, 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 effects on the literary production I feel is not really thoroughly researched or aired so much to the, um, uh, these days. It's rather uh, overshadowed uh, by more discussions of politics and so on. In her book, Hura looks at several uh, topics. She explodes, uh, explores the uh, status, uh, uh, looks at the marginalized voices in Arabic literary scholarship and also looks at the religious writings by the Shi'i uh, female population. She looks at the um, uh, can canonical challenges of uh, Arabic, um, uh, modern Arabic literature, and, uh, and she brings to it an interdisciplinary approach. And uh, many other, uh, so I'm sure, I obviously don't want to speak for Hura, but I sense that uh, the status of um, women in Arab societies, their literary voices will also be a focus. So you're not here to hear me this evening, and I need to warn you that my uh, internet connection has been playing up, so you might be delighted if I just completely disappear from this scene. <laughs> but And usually when the landline rings, you remember telephones with landlines, somehow the entire internet collapses. So if I disappear, you know that's what's happened. So can I ask you to very warmly and digitally um, welcome Dr. Hura Al-Hassan to start the talk for us this evening. Hura John, please, befar wait. We're all here. Thank ears. you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nargis. And a huge thank you to Aki for being such a diligent organizer. And of course, a huge thank you to Dr. Dina Matzal for um, in, uh, inviting me to share my research. So um, I'm going to start by sharing a little presentation, hopefully just to make things a bit more um, interesting given that you, uh, we can't you know, be together. So this is the next best thing. Usually I don't do PowerPoints, it's not my thing, but I think we'll have to, we'll have to do a PowerPoint for tonight. So I started my research 
by asking why authoritarian states in the modern Arab world are why they're pre preoccupied with culture. And what can the Arab novel tell us about the history of those states? And I wanted to challenge the grantedness with which we often deal with literature. So the idea that literature is always there in the background of the stage of world history, sitting innocently on bookshelves. And so I want to begin with the idea that it's more important that books exist than that they are read. And so here are some of the questions that my book poses in relation to the novel in Iraq under the bath. And some might be interesting, interesting to, uh, uh, to you if you're at SOAS. So my, um, my first question is, why is it that one can find Iraqi propaganda texts gifted to SOAS library at the height of the Iran-Iraq war? often with handwritten dedications by their authors. And what does this tell us about the role of international players in that war? The second question I have is, how is it that a religious romance novel written by the sister of an Ayatollah, how is it that it was reprinted eight times in 10 years during the 1970s? What does this tell us about female literacy in Iraq? And does it challenge the idea that the 70s were by and large a secular time for the Arab and Muslim world generally? And is it really useful to use uh, phrases uh, or words such as um, secular and, and religious in such an oppositional way? Does this apply to the um, Arab and Muslim world? And uh, lastly, why did um, Saddam Hussein author four novels in the last three years of his rule, reportedly right up until the last days before the American invasion of Iraq? I'd like to argue that culture is not just a state strengthening activity. So it's not just a mere tool for gaining political legitimacy and nor is it a mere extension of political discourse. Instead, I think that cultural discourses are essential in the formation of political ideologies and are a space through which authority reflects on itself and where opponents can challenge it. So coming back to the idea that it's more important that books exist than that they are read, what do I mean by that? I mean that books can be propagators of ideological messages before they're even opened by a target reader. Uh, this is because they're packaged in what Gerard Jeannette calls uh, paratexts that function as thresholds of interpretation. So paratexts are any information that surround the main text and, and present it to us. So, the title, the name of the author, illustrations, introduction, prologues. So let's have a look at how this works in practice. This is a book cover of one of the novels that I discuss in my book. And there are some obvious paratexts here. The writer uses a pseudonym and the writer is a woman. Um, so the pseudonym is Bintil Huda, so daughter of righteous guidance. Um, and we have the covers illustration so that, um, where a woman is um, dressed in conservative attire. Um, and the title, Al Fadila Tantasar, Virtue Prevails. So, all of which mark the, the book as kind of a girl's reading with a religious message. However, there are less obvious paratexts which emphasize the material presence of the text and are even more crucial to my mind. We know from the inside jacket of the book, and I actually have the, the book here. Um, that it, the novel was originally published in 1969, but this is a 1980 reprint, and this is the eighth edition. So um, in 11 years, it was um, reprinted um, eight times. The place of publication is Beirut, as you can see on the cover. And um, I was actually given this novel by a Saudi Shia woman from her private library. So we're gonna look at the text in a bit more detail in a bit, but suffice it to say that it's a text that was written by an Iraqi woman, was republished eight times by the time she was executed, and we'll talk about um, her life in a bit, um, mostly in Lebanon, and it found its way to the private libraries of Shia women in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. So the transnationalism of this text, its appeal to Arab Shia women, is a direct reflection of the text's Islamic message, which challenged the Arab nationalism propagated by the state. So the text's content is reflected in the, in the text's um, material presence. And so um, paratexts are not all equal. So in fact, the identity of the author is so central to understanding the social and political function of this text that in one edition, it dominates the entire book cover. And this is the, um, the picture that I've just shared now. So the author's real name is stated, Amina al-Sadr, sister of um, Ayatollah Muhammad Baqar Sadr, 
it marks her, uh, her status as a martyr quite clearly because she was arrested in 1978 and was executed by the Ba'ath. And the text is accompanied um, by a prologue um, written by a religious scholar from the Sadr family. So no illustrations, emphasis on the author's identity and the use of religious authority to elevate the text from a girl's reading to resistance literature. And now in the context of resistance, um, a copy of the author's other book was until at least 1979 still kept in Baghdad's National Library. So I'd like to argue that perceived threat to the state by a particular text, it's not inherent to a text, but it's rather determined by external factors. So who wrote it, when, the language, and where the text stands in relation to other texts in the author's own corpus of works. So perhaps if this text were written in the 1980s or the 90s, it might not have been perceived as such a threat. And I'll talk about why. So this is how most historians have divided the time span covered by my book. So um, 1968 to 1978, we usually talk about a secular nationalism that is ascendant um, from 1979 to 89 the rise of a conservative nationalism, obviously framed by two important events, the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War. And then from 1990 to 2003, the, a full towing of the Islamic line. So full kind of a full embrace um, of kind of Islamic iconography um, and discourses by the state. And my texts really complexify this categorization, especially the middle period, which has been treated as a kind of transitional period from secularism to Fully being fully towing the Islamic line. Um, the war novels of the Iran-Iraq war do assert a strong national identity, but they also reveal anxiety as well. And um, Shia religious novels appear in the first section, which is the secular nationalist section, supposedly, and in the last um, section, 1990 to uh, 2003. As for the novels of Saddam Hussein, they engage with all the discourses in a kind of mishmash um, of discourses. So I don't think that, I think what the um, texts that I look at do is that they complexify the way we um, see Iraqi's, uh, Iraqi history. So let's have a look at the text then. So um, Bint al-Huda or Amin al-Sadr signals the text as a resistance literature right from the get-go. And this is her prologue to Virtue Prevails. Um, this, my dear reader, is not a story for I am not a novelist or a story writer. In fact, I've never tried to write a story until now. Instead, what I present to you today is simply one of many pictures of the society we live in, where the forces of good and evil collide and where aqida, or religious creed, battles against the culture and behaviors of imperialism and imperialists. So she describes her novel as an attempt to revive a silent media apparatus, and those are her words. So acutely aware of the ideological potential of the novel very early on when not many people were aware of this, um, but that a religious woman should be aware of the novel as a didactic tool rather than a religious man is, is no coincidence, I think, as novel reading was uh, construed as a female activity. And by the time this book was first published in 1969, translations of popular European novels flooded the market of the most literate female population in the Arab world. Thanks mainly to an effective literacy campaign, Iraqi women were now the target audience of an array of state-funded publications. I'm going to show you some of them in a bit. So first, um, just to look at the cover uh, of my um, book, this is actually a photo taken of, um, of a woman um, in an illiteracy class in a factory, actually. Um, and it's taken by a French uh, journalist. And um, literacy, uh, um, thanks to literacy campaigns, rates, uh, literacy rates went up by uh, around 300% compared to the turn of the century. And this represented 98% of the female population. And uh, maybe a few people would know that um, Saddam was actually given a, a prize from the UN for his efforts to eradicate Ill illiteracy. Um, and what you see here um, are some publications um, published by the Ministry of Information and Culture. And these detail the achievements of Iraqi women in all fields and express those uh, achievements in terms of dress and gender mixing. So if you look at the picture on the right, the caption says, the sight of an Iraqi woman in an Aba or an Abaya is becoming something of the past. 
And on the left hand side, a group of young women in their regular Western attire at a public event. It, there are other pictures in this book that um, specifically use the word gender mixed. So, they, so there is a need, you feel, that, to specify that this is a mixed gathering as opposed to a segregated gathering. Um, um, also, members of the uh, female arm of the Ba'ath Party, the General Federation of Iraqi Women, were sent out to religious gatherings, uh, to Shia religious gatherings, to discourage women from wearing the um, Abba or the Abaya. So this politicized the issue of women's dress and and, and um, kind of uh, made uh, transformed dress into an ideological marker and a site of contention. So I'm going to go back to, if I can, yes, back to the novel um, and to talk a bit about its plot. So the context of the novel is this fear of westernization spearheaded by the state and perceived as an aggressive and deliberate attempt to marginalize religious sensibilities. Uh, Bint al Huda saw women as the country's first line of moral defense and the most fickle and vulnerable to the onslaught of foreign ideas. And the characterization of the antagonist um, in the novel reflects this view of women as kind of easily um, duped. So the novel tells the story of two cousins, Naqa and Su'ad, and Naqa, Naqa means purity in Arabic, and actually many girls, many Iraqi girls are called Naqa because of this novel. Um, and so um, at the beginning of the novel, Naqa is engaged. She's very young, she's 16. She's engaged to a religious man um, whom she later discovers was uh, pursued by her undevout cousin, Su'ad. And out of uh, jealousy and spite, Su'ad then concocts a plan to ruin Naqa's reputation. And, by convincing her own wayward husband to tempt her into sin. And of course the plan fails and we know this because virtue prevails and Su'ad is threatened with divorce by her husband at the end of the novel. At one point in the novel, Su'ad tries to convince Naqat that she is a recluse and encourages her to integrate into modern society. Um, Su'ad is said to spend her days in beauty salons and her nights in nightclubs and parties. Um, but when Naqa challenges Su'ad about her idea of what society is, Su'ad responds with this quote um, that you see here. So what is this society? Why can't we see them publicly, these millions who share your views? So Virtue Prevails paints a picture of religious uh, circles as forming a society in the shadows, outside the norms of the kind of collective identity envisioned and projected by the state. But although it is under threat, its author predicts the ultimate triumph of virtue represented by Naqa over vice, represented by Su'ad. But should we take these uh, conservative views of women at face value? For all her emphasis on young marriage, traditional dress, and the home, um, Amina Sadr herself never married um, until her, her death, in, when she was 40 when she, died, when she was executed. She also wrote and set up programs to allow working class women to develop financial independence, so like sewing, uh, uh, kind of skills programs and, and things. And she also was um, instrumental in convincing um, the Hausa, the religious seminaries in, um, in Najaf to uh, send, to allow uh, them, to allow their daughters or to, to convince them that it was okay to send um, uh, uh, women to uh, study or girls to study at public schools. So despite claims of realism, Characters are symbols through which to resist the moral corruption of political authority and should not be taken at face value. Um, Asadra's aim seems to be the preservation of a traditional way of life, but using a modern form, and in so doing, she anticipates the efficacy of the novel as a genre. Um, political texts that I look at use women as proxies, uh, almost all of them do, the war novels, the religious romances, and Saddam's novels. Um, so they use women as a proxy to represent the nation. And this is not exceptional to Iraq. We know that nationalist literature does this quite a lot um, to use women as uh, symbols, while sometimes uh, simultaneously eradicating um, their rights. Um, and we're going to look at that kind of contradiction in a bit. So we're going to come to the war now. So one of the most futile and disastrous wars in modern history. Um, the Iran-Iraq war led to massive economic and social upheavals for both countries. Its effects on Iraqi culture were unprecedented, though. The production of novels under st state patronage led to the serialization and publication of around 75 novels and short story collections in eight years, which is a remarkable number. 
On the other hand, um, the Iran-Iraq war represented a major setback in the gains made by Iraqi women in the 1970s in terms of employment and other areas and, and showed that the politics of progress adopted by the state was a strategy rather than a genuine commitment. The existence of this quantity of novels is just as important, in my opinion, as their content. So in my book, I use the term over language or language in excess uh, to characterize the novels. They're unsurprisingly long, dense, repetitive, sloganistic, and use kind of tired tropes and repeat, rep, you know, repetitive um, storylines. And they use sheer bulk to swamp uh, voices of alterity. The plot lines usually involve some sort of love interest or potential marriage between an Arab man and a Kurdish girl, which never happens anyway, because one or both are killed um, um, in the war and usually with a smile on their face. Najee Al Ali notes that the state actively encouraged Arab men to marry Kurdish girls in order to better integrate them. So there were policies that, uh, that were um, actively encouraging Arab men to marry Kurdish girls and not the opposite, of course. Um, and we see this reflected half-heartedly in the texts. So there are unsettling references to the rape of Kurdish Iraqi rather than Arab women. Rape is an effective tool, of course, in war, so very effective in galvanizing men into action, but also threatens the masculinity potentially of, of Iraqi men due to their in inability to protect their women folk. So um, Kurdish women are kind of a, an ideal solution because they are both outside and inside the nation. And that's why it's always Kurdish women um, that are victims of rape. So this is an example of how discourse on women becomes a proxy for racial, for, for discourses on racial difference and loyalty, anxieties about loyalty to the state. So the texts um, were accompanied by state literary criticism and supported by state literary festivals and an annual prize was allocated to the best novel of the year. And I have uh, some pictures of the uh, covers of these novels. So the one on the right uh, won the um, prize for best novel in 1983. And I analyze it in some depth um, in my book. Um, the one in the middle, Dancing on the Shoulders of Death, Al-Raqs ala Aktaf al Maut, uh, claims to be the first novel of the war. And then this is another um, uh, novel from about 1984. Um, didn't win the prize though. Um, women, of course, are notably absent as authors and, and, and protagonists in part because the genres favored by the state were war memoirs and with no real experience of the battlefront, women's voices were sidelined. Economic variables were a driving factor for state-sponsored literature. And for this reason, the 1990s did not see the production of much state-sponsored fiction due to the imposition of crippling sanctions on Iraq. But with the absence of, of this deluge of state-sponsored texts, we begin to see the emergence of political texts by women, both inside and outside um, Iraq. And I would like to now look at some personal accounts that play with the conventions of um, novel writing and blur the boundaries of autobiography, poetry, and fiction. These texts also function as um, double resistance. So they critique both the Ba'ath and Western imperialism, um, which is why they're published, published in both um, Arabic and English. So the texts that I'm going to look at are the only texts that are not propagandistic. And the reason why I wanted to include real literature alongside ideological and propagandistic literature is because I wanted to explore what artists, real artists or real writers, we're going to talk about this idea of what is real literature, and, um, but what do they do with propaganda? Do they engage in dialogue with it? Do they parody it? Do they ignore it? Do they use some of it? And um, we're going to look at some examples here. And I'm going to start with um, Nuha Aradi, and she's the author of um, Baghdad Diaries, um, which she wrote in 1998 and then published in English in 2003. She's a ceram, she was, um, she died in 2004. She was a ceramicist and a diarist and she looks at um, the effects of sanctions on her affluent family in Baghdad. Um, and uh, she, this particular quote is, um, was after she, she uh, had an exhibition called Embargo Art, quite a famous exhibition. And um, she writes about um, Western journalists reaction to her exhibition. So I'm just going to read it. Um, the CNN correspondent was totally uninterested in my art. She just wanted to know whether all Iraqis were rallying around Hussein Kamen. What for, I said. 
but I will explain some of my sculptures to you if you don't censor what I say. These particular sculptures are made of large coiled springs from lorries that I've painted to look like snakes. Inside these coiled springs are a few stones painted to look like animals. The snakes symbolize dictatorship. I told her they swallow people whole, not just our sort of dictatorship, but all of them, yours included. In fact, I added, yours is the biggest of all because it has swallowed up the whole world. So very clearly there's a kind of a play on both dictatorships here and um, clear anti-imperialist anti and anti-American sentiment here. And um, actually, um, Aradi uh, died in 2004 um, from cancer, which he blamed on the use of depleted uranium in, in Iraq. Uh, and she was a, it was a great loss to Iraqi culture. Um, I want to look at another um, text. And this text is by Haifa Zengana, who is a regular contributor to The Guardian, and she's a political activist. And, and Haifa was... Um, uh, imprisoned in the 1970s for joining the Communist Party. Um, however, due to certain um, uh, factors, uh, she was released. And, and I'm going to talk about her release and, and what that means in terms of uh, what we're talking about uh, today. So um, this is an excerpt from Dreaming of Baghdad, which was originally publi published as Through the Vast Halls of Memory in 1990, and then Dreaming of Baghdad in 2009. So she says, I was released after six months, during which time I was moved again to a prostitute's prison. I had become ill, my face covered in sores. I cried for any tender word or gesture. My hair began falling out. For a whole year afterwards, I was reduced to an entity closed in upon itself, absorbed in remembering that howling, remembering the dead. So um, Zangana was the only female in that communist cell. She was arrested. Um, at the age of 20 for giving out brochures, communist um, um, leaflets and pamphlets, and she was um, tortured, um, but she knew um, her family were well, not that well connected, but uh, you know how it is in, <laughs> in the Middle East, if you know someone, um, she was able um, through uh, uh, people that she knew, knew to, to, to be released um, from prison, but only after she had signed um, a, a document that where she basically says that she was not political and that she was in the cell um, because she was a prostitute and that's why they moved her to the prostitute's prison. So um, it kind of, it, it, I think it's an important text to look at um, because it shows how, sh how um, state deep, I don't call it skin deep, how state deep um, discourses of, 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 of progressive discourses on women were under the bath. Um, because again, we see the weaponizing of, of female sexuality here and, and the fear of, of uh, losing honor in this particular text. Um, the last artistic text that I really enjoy looking at before I come back to the novels of Saddam, just checking the time, yeah, we're okay. Um, I'm looking at here, Dunya Mikhail's A Diary of a Wave Outside the Sea, a fantastic um, book that is both poetry and, and fiction. And um, I want to read the poem first because the author left Iraq because of this poem. It was published in 1995 as you know, the book as part of a, a collection of poetry. And then um, and another half was added um, once she'd left Iraq. And uh, this edition is both in Arabic and in English. So it's a bilingual um, edition that you see here. So let's look at this poem then. Um, in his spare time, Zeus kept himself busy cutting the stars from the sky and sticking them onto chests and shoulders. He busied himself with his hobby so much that eventually the sky lost all its stars. His tigers paced in their cages. They purred in the night as they devoured the spoils. And in the morning, when Zeus passed, they mewed. These tigers gave lessons on the art of domestication before a portrait of Zeus holding a whip in one hand and gold in the other. So the poem, I mean, the text is poetic, but there are, this is one of the more like poetic uh, uh, parts of the text, but in other parts, it reads more like prose. It's actually kind of a, a melange between poetry and, and fiction. So the poem is obviously a parody of authoritarian rule in Iraq, but it was approved for publication in 1995. Possibly, this is my interpretation, possibly because it contains some scathing critiques of US sanctions and their devastating effects on the Iraqi people, some really poignant poems, and the state saw that, that this could be used to their advantage. But it could also have been uh, published as an indictment against the author, so uh, basically a trap. 
so to allow something to be published and then to hold an author responsible for its publication. In fact, the author was uh, uh, questioned about this poem and, and left the country almost immediately because she feared for her life. I'm going to look at the novels of Saddam Hussein that were written at the lowest point in Iraqi state production. So the cruelest sanctions, in, perhaps in human history, had done more than destroy Iraq's cultural production, of course. But for Saddam, this was a final attempt to revitalize culture and to ensure that there was a record of his legacy. What is immediately evident is the humility motif that we saw as well with Bint al Huda. But um, Saddam here does not claim the novels as explicitly his. So um, the novels are like, um, so it's the title of the novel and then by its author. Uh, rather than Saddam Hussein, you won't see his name on any of the um, uh, co book covers here. Um, I don't have time to go into all of them in a lot of detail, but taken as a whole, these novels are a culmination of all the contradictory discourses on women propagated by the Ba'ath. Um, so you will see supposedly progressive discourses undercut by conservative tribal and religious views. And there's a tension in the novels between women as a woman as a symbol and real women. And for this reason, you'll find the most conservative views on women appear in Saddam's autobiographical work, Men in the City. Whereas more liberal views of women as potential political agents um, can be found in the novels that are set in ancient Mesopotamia. So the first and fourth novels are set in ancient Mesopotamia and then the ones in the middle are, are set in, in modern Iraq. These two, so this is Zabiba and the King. So this is the novel that has received most interest because it was um, Saddam's first novel published in 2000. And the cover is actually plagiarized from a Canadian artist's uh, painting. And, and he came out and said that he hadn't given permission um, for Saddam to use it. So, but it's, it quite clearly marks the uh, book as kind of a historical fantasy. And then you have this one as well, Get Out of Here, or be, Get Out of Here, Damned One. And some people have translated it as Begone Demons, but I don't like that translation. But these two were published 2000 and then 2003. And these two are set in ancient Mesopotamia. And both have Joan of Arc type female figures that lead revolts against foreign invaders. Some critics have even claimed that Nahwa, Nahwa is a type of chivalry, it doesn't exactly translate to chivalry. The heroine of the last novel was meant to represent Ragad Hussein, Saddam's daughter. And they claimed that Saddam had lost all tr trust in men around him and that therefore men in the novels are not depicted in a positive light, whereas women were. But all these interpretations are projections of our own um, ideological backgrounds and, and what we want to see in these novels, I think. I have a few excerpts from the novels. Um, I have an excerpt actually from Zabiba and the King, a very short one. This is the first novel that was translated by the Americans. They were very interested in it um, before the um, uh, in, uh, invasion of Iraq. Um, set in ancient Mesopotamia, it's uh, the story of King Arab, who is Saddam, and the peasant Zabiba, who represents the Iraqi people. And they have an adulterous affair, and, and but she is depicted as a heroine who dies for her country and her king. And this, these were her final words. I die, but long live King Arab. And in contrast, in his autobiography, which is here called Men in a City, um, even the, uh, the title is meant to um, kind of evoke a kind of false sense of humility. So it's not about him, it's about men in a city, but it's actually more about him. Um, his autobiography, he's keen to stress the importance of propriety and tribal traditions. And, and, referring, and in referring to how his mother was pregnant when his father died, he says, every woman must disclose her pregnancy, even at the earliest stages, so that if her husband were to die, she would not be accused of fornication or adultery. And so these are the tribal ways. Um, so quite a contrast between um, the two views of adultery, for example. So when it comes to real women, we find more conservative views. Saddam's second novel, um, The 45 Castle, this is the one that's been the most neglected. I think it's huge. It's very, very big. It's dense. And it reads like one of the war novels in that it's an Arab man who is engaged to a Kurdish girl. Um, and of course, they don't marry. And interestingly, they don't marry because um, the Kurdish girl is not religious enough for the protagonist. So we have a mishmash here of, of different um, discourses. 
Um, but at the beginning of the novel, the um, Kurdish protagonist is actually a mouthpiece for the Ba'ath Party and it's liberal, the liberal face of the Ba'ath Party. So let's have a look at what Shatrin, who is the protagonist of uh, the Kurdish protagonist of the Fortified Castle, says in response to um, one, one of the um, characters kind of uh, detailing of achievements um, uh, by Iraqi men. So she says, but you did not mention the name of a single woman. It is as if Iraqi women have not made sacrifices. Do you not remember Firyal who was martyred at the beginning of the conflict with the monsters of Iran when their agents of Iranian origin threw bombs at students while they were congregating in Al Mustansariya University in the spring of 1980? That was very long winded. Um, but it shows you kind of how they read. They read like that in Arabic as well. So do you not remember Mosul's uh, martyr Hafsal Omeri who was hung on electricity pole by communists during Qasim's era? What about the bride of Mandeli who was martyred in her wedding gown and the martyr artist Layla Al-Attar? So um, a lot of these um, uh, characters are mouthpieces for um, uh, Ba'athist ideology. And it seems as if there's just a, uh, someone just wanted to um, kind of uh, use as many um, names and do a lot of name dropping and, and, and use a lot of as many dates as, as you can kind of challenge. Um, and it, but it does uh, show the kind of discourses that you had at the beginning um, of, of the war and, and towards the end of the 70s that are uh, focusing on um, uh, female equality and the achievements of women in times of peace and in times of war, especially here. So uh, I haven't, I want to end with a kind of an overview and my final thoughts of how this project can be um, useful in understanding um, modern Arabic culture kind of generally and, and the relationship between the novel and history. So um, the weaponization of progressive discourses is, is an ongoing state project in the Arab world. So Iraq was not the last Arab state to patronage the novel as a sign of high culture. And as the peak of national maturity, we actually now see other states patronaging the novel, but also being patrons of the museums, the arts and universities and using all of that as a political tool. And I think the Iraqi experience has shown us what can happen when progressive discourses on women or the arts are only state deep. Also, I think literary texts can reflect certain social and historical experiences that are neglected in traditional histori historiographies. And finally, in the field of literary studies, using the canon exclusively as the epitome of literary discourse belies the fact that popular and elite discourses are in dialogue and inform one another. So propaganda and high art do inform one another. And in the same way, discourses of collaboration and resistive ones are reliant on one another. It isn't that the state is the originator and other discourses are derivative and are mere responses because no discourse is fully original, but um, also state discourses often preempt and position themselves in opposition to previous discourses. Um, and I think that's about it for me. Um, I, thank you so much for listening to my presentation and I would love to hear if you have any questions. Fantastic, thank you, Hurojan. Um, there are, um, uh, uh, yes, I think Aki has just invited some calls. Uh, it, it's very interesting, I remember that um, you know, at the beginning of the of sort of hostilities with Iraq, obviously going to the post-Islamic revolution in Iran before that, there wasn't sort of much um, discussion of, apart from, you know, ambitions of Saddam Hussein to rebuild Babylon, et cetera, et cetera, which is, you know, from the Iranian side. But then there were references to these novels, but obviously they would have perhaps, you know, picked and chosen whatever could be, siphoned off to demonize obviously from sort of Iranian uh, a point of view so it's very interesting to see this and the girls and it, I was looking um, at you know the names that um, I think you know Zangene which again you know is such a um, recognizable surname across the region both in Iran to think that um, how it is better it is worse to be 
accused of being a communist that you you'll happily accept to be a prostitute and be there that has sort of in the eyes of the state or whatever that is more acceptable it, it's amazing i um Wanted to know, and so what has happened? You obviously focus on this period, and what about the present time? Obviously, literary production takes a while. Societies um, are in shell shock when the uh, invasion of Iraq, in a post, uh, you know, sort of control of Iraq in the uh, post Saddam era, and the uh, interference of so many states in it. And is that is now put on the back burner? Is the you know state still since two thousand and three, which was I think your cutoff point on that line, this uh, production of the female voice for political reasons is is this an ongoing project? I think you sort of touched upon it, but not in details. Is that? Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah. So my conclusion, the conclusion to my book looks mm. at how a little bit um, about how um, writers have responded to, as you say, the shell shock of war post 2003. And what I've noticed and what I was really interested in, in that I felt that uh, women and men responded in a similar way to this, uh, this shell shock of, of the American invasion. I look at some uh, male works that are quite similar. So this idea of memory being unreliable, this idea of writing very brief texts, complete opposite to these very confident lengthy texts, just really brief texts that are just unsure of themselves and feel that they are, the mem that their memories are unreliable and that very fragmented texts. And actually the Arab world has witnessed an explosion in novel writing um, since 2003 in all parts of the Arab world, but especially in Iraq. So I am interested in kind of challenging the idea that women do things a bit differently, or there is something that's, you know, that we can say that this is a female response to war. Mm. So for example, um, a response that focuses a lot on grief and mourning, that that is necessarily a female, um, a female response. But definitely um, there's a lot of, you can see a lot of reusing of language. There are actually pro, I look at a pro bath, um, text from 2006. So the same man that I looked at, the same author who wrote novels for the Iran-Iraq war and um, won a state prize, um, uh, kind of uh, left for the US. And then he still wrote a pro bath uh, writings in 2006. And and um, I had actually a quote, but I thought it'd be too long. But there was a quote where he says, uh, what have you done to us? What have we done to you, Abu Uday? So the, the Saddam. And so you do see that there is a kind of, um, that. Th these novels created a language that is being reused, um, um, uh, challenged, but reused. And a, a lot of the language, unfortunately, is sectarian language as well. So we have specific, yeah, exactly, uh, yeah, specific kind of uh, mm -hmm. terms that didn't exist before, but that, yeah. we, that we use now. Um, yes, yeah. And before I go to uh, so, uh, several questions are rolling up, and the role of the censor, the state censor, is sort of you know the literary <laughs> censor. Is that Prominent. Is this something that comes up in um, your research? Are there uh, voices that are absolutely quashed or not allowed to come or um, not so prominent at the moment? But oh, now in Iran, in Iran yeah, 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 a lot of uh, texts are, are, are yeah. published outside now. That's and right. Yeah, that's outside, outside, unfortunately, yeah. that's unfortunately yeah. well, the case. But, but there's a lot of self censorship. I like the idea of. of, of I don't like the idea of censorship, but uh, but it's it's very interesting to look at um, the kind of you know the give and take and and um, uh, and the fact that actually uh, some texts would be acceptable if they were only published a couple of years later. Yes. So, it's, so it's really kind of a very delicate um, balance. Exactly. And and and, and because uh, mm -hmm. censors were so temperamental, people were very scared, so they would err on the side of caution. So you end up with these very just texts that have no nuance in them because they were scared of being mis mis misread or misrepresented. That, yeah. So there are a couple of questions. One a very brief one, which I, uh, I start with that. Um, uh, it, was there a ghostwriter for Saddam? Was this really his own writing? So this is from um, Eckhart words. Uh, did Saddam Hussein really write these novels or did he have ghostwriters? You Thank you so much for that yeah. question. So, as I said, because I look at um, 
the the fact that it's more important that books exist. Um, so what I talk about in my book is that perhaps it's more important to ask why is it he wanted us to believe that he wrote these novels yeah, rather yeah. than if he actually did. But actually, I had. Um, I actually, through my research, I did a lot of research and I can't really give my source on this, but um, recently there's been a very recent um, development um, um, and we, you know, in my research, yes, he did write them, yes. So some new documents have surfaced from Iraq that have revealed that he was actually the author of these novels. For that. And then uh, combining two questions. So one is looking at the role of uh, communist uh, women, the role that they played in challenging the um, ideological uh, propaganda of the state. Um, and uh, um, that are there, uh, you know, in your research, did you come across, you know, more prominent communist women in your book? And the other question was, uh, what about queer literature? What are there in your research? Are there takes, stories, novels, etc., that are written by queer women? Was there anything shared about being queer at the time? The idea of homosexuality, is that a, at all discussed? So these questions, and then I'll have there quite a few questions coming hard and fast. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone. So nothing queer at all. So you're looking at a society where, and I look at actually uh, um, how it's difficult to um, adopt kind of a gender theoried approach to texts like this. We are looking at uh, a kind of a literary and cultural landscape where there is absolutely <laughs> kind of no chance of challenging the idea of, uh, of, uh, of gender. So nowadays in Iraq, you might find some more texts, but during uh, under Saddam, definitely not, um, definitely not. So yeah. none there. And as for the commun, so. So the Communist Party, unfortunately, was one of the first um, uh, parties to be immediately kind of uh, eliminated in Iraq. Um, I didn't find, other than um, uh, Haifa Zengen, I didn't find any other, actually, um, communist writers. But I did find some communist literary uh, critics. Um, and actually, one of the first uh, literary critics that I used to start my PhD on this topic was communist. And he mm. wrote from outside Iraq. So, no, again, unfortunately not. If anyone, if there are any here yeah. and there, please do let me know. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to know. Yeah. And um, Maria Bovia, forgive me, uh, audience, if I mispronounce your names. Um, uh, something which I think is probably on all our minds is that I think it, it was a reference, was it Bento Huda who was uh, executed? And so what was the public response? So when uh, the author of such a popular book, um is um executed was there what, what was and what form i mean i'm adding that bit to maria's book that i was thinking that for example the media's reaction the journals of the time or academia or whatever um and general public here how did that um what responses did that uh, cause but i mean i mean definitely it sent shockwaves um mm. remember i mean bin, bin Huda was known Actually, she wasn't executed because of her novels. She was executed mm. mainly for her um, political activism yeah. and social yeah. activism. So one of the lasting legacies of that execution is that you find no no woman. <laughs> I mean, there are no prominent women. Um, uh, I mean, sh Shia religious women mm. um, yeah. uh, that did any kind of political activism because I mean, the idea of kind of the violation of the, of the sacred, kind of the, the sacred uh, body of a, of a religious woman, I mean, through torture and, and execution was, was very shocking. Um, but the, the popularity kind of moved, I think actually it made her even more popular. Um, but, but I mean, it, it kind of, everything kind of took off, but outside Iraq, um, the, the, you know, we, there is no way for us to kind of gorge public opinion um, mm -hmm. on the issue inside Iraq because the Dawah party by then was outlawed and they all left and yeah uh, but um there are I actually um write about other religious writers in my book so I, I, mm -hmm. I write about four so three other writers after Bintil Huda mm -hmm. and and she made it possible for other conservative women to write and to write using their own names so it became respectable to write because of her that's her lasting legacy in terms of uh, novel writing. And I look at, in the book, actually, I look at how these women have dedicated their works to Bintil Huda. 
So yes. their dedication is how they dedicate to, yeah. to her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, taking uh, you on that, uh, 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 moving to um, uh, another question here that, um, uh, first of all, how did you go about selecting your um, novels, your, you know, the corpus that you chose? And did it, did you think about expanding this to, to the, you know, Arabic speaking world, you know, in uh, Syrian uh, novelists or other writers? write in Arabic? That's also a really good question. That's what yeah. I wanted to do in the first mm -hmm. place. So I wanted to do a comparative project. And the comparative project was supposed to look at um, representations of um, civil war and sectarian difference in the Arab novel. Mm -hmm. And then what I found was it was very difficult for me to do an interdisciplinary project and to do a comparative project at the same time. It was yeah. just too sprawling. Too much, yeah. I had to yeah, I had to either do an interdisciplinary kind of Absolutely. product or just do a comparative. But um, I hope, I hope that there will be more um, kind of studies that kind of not copy. I'm not I mean it's copying, but I mean that that will do yeah. what, uh, have a look at the same kind of topics um, in Syria or mm -hmm. in uh, Syria would be the easiest one to compare because of uh, Baathism. Um, but I, I haven't unfortunately because I had to uh, limit my. Uh, the, uh, the text to Iraq. But as for yes. how I chose the texts in Iraq, so 75 novels from the Iran-Iraq War, um, which ones do you choose? They all read the same. They all sound the same when you read them. So what I thought I would do is take one author and look at how, um, look at the changes in political discourse and how they're reflected in the literary discourse. So I found that the same author was very belligerent at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then when the state wanted to make peace with Iran, um, authors were encouraged to write about the suffering of the war and to look at, to encourage people to vent their frustrations and to prepare them for peace. So I thought it'd be better to take one author and kind of show kind of the changes rather than you know, take all of the authors together. But I do look at, for example, um, the titles of novels, because I think that the titles on their own can just, you know, that there's an ideological message there in, in the titles. So the message, the, 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 the titles are, are like, the lowly ones and the great ones. So we all know what they're oh, doing. Right. Or, um, or, or for example, night and day. So all these oppositional metaphors to show kind of um, Iraq's uh, cultural and moral superiority. Yeah. In the war. So I look at things like that. I try to be as um, comprehensive as possible. But the, I think the most difficult thing was um, looking at artistic novels. I felt kind of bad that I kind of, the, I didn't, I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that this is what Iraqi cultural production is. This no. is one strand. Mm -hmm. There were amazing novels written, even inside Iraq. Um, for example, this is my next one of my other projects is, yes. is how come good literature was still written in Iraq at the time? Very little, but how did they escape censorship? And they did it mainly by looking at Iraq's um, mythological kind of mm -hmm. myth mythology and Iraq's past and talking about the past rather than the present. And and, and that's the, one of the ways they say, uh, escape censorship. For that Sorry. thing, yeah. So uh, while um, you're still on the topic of selections, um, uh, Dr. Erica Hunter says, says she would like to know that did you uh, consider or were there uh, uh, novels by um, from the Christian communities um, in Iraq or other, you know, minority uh, communities there that you'd. Um, considered or were you more focused on the Shi Sunni perhaps the war related Iran Iraq stuff? Actually the uh, the text that I uh, quoted the Zeus poem from yeah. is actually yeah. by Julia Mikhail who is a Christian Iraqi. I wonder because the name is yeah. I wasn't the sure name, yeah. Been, yeah Marinette absolutely. Well, but I um the thing is I'm very weary of of um so for example Haifa Zenkana is is half Kurdish and half Arab. Yeah. Uh, Dunia Mikhail is Christian um, Iraqi. Um, the third author, um, Nuha Radi, is a uh, Shi uh, Shia Iraqi, but from an affluent family, and her father was a diplomat, actually. Mm. So, do we really want to say that um, Christian Iraqis write in a different way? And I actually look at a Christian author who is uh, uh, one of my favorite authors, Sinan Anton, who is uh, who's not a woman, but um, um, and I, I feel like. Um, when we when we do, I mean, obviously the way people write is influenced by their backgrounds. You can't say that that's not the case. But sometimes I think as scholars, we like we we subconsciously over overestimate 
uh, certain aspects of our research because we're so um, immersed in them. So I could maybe someone would read the book and say, it's all about the Shia Sunnis. I've tried to be aware of my own positionality. Um, so um, I, I don't like to, uh, I wouldn't say that, for example, Christian Iraqis wrote in a way that was different from um, Shia Iraqis. And actually I wanted to say something about the, um, the kind of the texts that I showed you that were produced by the uh, government. Mm -hmm. So um, Shia women were part of that process. By and large, they were secular. It's not that the, all the Shia were religious and all the Sunnis weren't. They were, they were very much part of that process, um, as were all Iraqis. So. Yeah, but yeah, Dunya Mikhail is great. I mean, yeah. everyone should read her. She's great. Mm -hmm. She's a Christian Iraqi. Very good. And then two topics, uh, two questions that focus differently on um, uh, Kurdish women and their presentation. And so a, a question from Istanbul, from Asli Karacha, and it says, thank you, everybody thanks you for your presentation. And um, uh, I was curious, it says, about the representation of Kurdish women in the Iraqi literature. I wonder whether there have been literary reactions from the Kurdish women and writers to this kind of state discourse of encouraging Arab men to marry Kurdish women or discourses of rape of Kurdish women. And on the Kurdish, again, Yasser Ali uh, says that if you consider Iraq as a nation state, do you consider Kurdish women writers as part of this nation? Definitely they are. Of course yeah. they are. And yeah. are you, and, and do you look at, you know, the writings of Kurdish women? Uh, will, will you look at them or do you look at them uh, in your project? Yeah. So actually, uh, I talk a lot about Kurdish women in my um, in my book. I find it I, I found it very surprising the way Kurds are dealt with. Um, more so with Shi with the Shia, you don't see the word Shia at all. There's like a complete blackout on the word um, in the novel. So you just know that this character is Shia because you know they come from this particular part of Iraq. But with the Kurds, it's very clear. It's very clearly stated that this person from, is from uh, Kurdistan. And it's a kind of, um, you want them to be included, but you kind of, you're really angry at them because they don't want to be included or you think they don't want to be included. And at one point, um, there's a lot of national stereotyping in these novels. So um, so one of the Arab men says to this uh, girl, why are you stubborn? Is it because all Kurdish people are stubborn? <laughs> so, for example, mm. um, so a lot of um, ethnic stereotyping. Um, as I said, um, Haifa Zenkana is half Kurdish, um, mm. and actually, she, her um, her father is Kurdish, and her mother is um, an Iraqi from Najaf, I think, as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so she is. If you're going to say that the father is Kurdish, so she's Kurdish. I mean, it, it's so difficult to get into identity politics, and I, I yeah. don't like to get into it. Um, I haven't, other than um, Hafez and Gunn, looked at any Kurdish uh, writings by women. I'm sure there has to be, and maybe in different languages, but perhaps in Kurdish, perhaps in Turkish, or in, um, and, yeah. or, or in other languages, because the Kurds left so early and they had their own, you know, they were, they had, you know, their, their own kind of self autonomy. Enclave, so, yeah. So yeah. unfortunately, I don't have so much on uh, Kurdish, but I, I'm very interested in race in general, because if you look at the way, um, uh, race is, is represented in, in, in the propaganda novels, and we're talking about the use of the word Ajami, for example, to denote either Iranians or as non-Arabs, and um, the, uh, the use of women as a proxy for race is very interesting, and I look at that in quite a lot of detail. There's a, such a, you know, there's such an obsession with racial purity and the, and the fear of contamination that you see in some of these novels, so you have kind of very progressive, let's, let's all intermarry, and then you have this fear of it, it, that you know, by intermarrying, you're, you know, polluting your stock or you're, you're weakening this, you know, Arab chivalry that you mm. have in your genes. So th there is that anxiety. But no, I haven't looked in, in a lot of detail. I, I put all these women in one um, chapter because I felt like they all represented Iraq. I just felt that they were, you know, a Christian Iraqi and a yeah. Kurdish and a yeah. Shia. I felt like they, they all represented uh, uh, Iraq. And I, I didn't feel like I could separate them there are aspects that you can pick up that you know this is a christian kind of uh, reference but of course yeah. you know you know it's it, you know they're all very authentic iraqi voices yeah all of them are authentic yes i think that or sometimes it's very annoying for the authors or writers i mean you can say from iran that if there are certain issues that reflect 
of the society as a whole, whether it's, for example, custody battles, if that yes. comes in, as if it is divorce, or if it's compulsory hijab or not. And some of these, it doesn't matter in Iran whether you're a Zoroastrian, Christian, or she is certainly whatever you, exactly. the, the law of the land is hijab. So it, sometimes when you hear authors uh, being interviewed, they find it very annoying that this is not, this is perhaps, if you want to narrow it down, is a feminist issue, for example, or if it is, you know, a, a female issue, a maternal issue, you don't need to then bring these angles, you don't need to hush the voice of a humanity in that geographic bound it's not even male or female if you're talking about oppression or you know the um state apparatus to uh, quash certain voices um there is a question about the role of the uh, publishing houses and um it says that you know we're, uh, that we're used as a platform for these texts that you see so um, Sara Farhan says, I'm thinking along the inverse of the saying, books are written in Cairo, published in Beirut, and read in Baghdad. Read in so in that Baghdad, was yeah. all this. In your case, the books are written in Baghdad, published in Beirut, and read abroad. I'm also mm. wondering if you can talk about just generally story arches, narrative prose, etc. Is there something political in the cultural structure of Bentul Huda's texts. That might take us on to yet another uh, full le lecture, the latter part. But certainly it would be very good to know about the publishing houses, whether some were probably arms of the state, some independent, but just generally to... Oh, uh, very few them. independent uh, publishers. Mm -hmm. So a lot. I look actually at book production in detail using like a statistical analysis and look mm -hmm. at the kinds of books that were published. So you look at, for example, philosophy, nothing on philosophy. So philosophy may be not amenable to propaganda, a bit too nuanced, a bit too uh, obtuse, quite difficult to, uh, to use as propaganda. And then you look at the rise of the humanities, no sciences. In a war, you need technological advancements, for example, you need all sorts of things, scientific publications, no scientific publications during the war, but the rise of the humanities. Um, and um, it, it's, it really points to the fact that it was an ideological war, really, just really it was a war about ideology. And so I look a lot actually at publishing houses. Interestingly, a lot of women uh, were uh, managing these publishing houses during the war because the men were at war. Actually, one of my Iraqi friends, her mom, um, uh, was in charge of the publishing house. But very regulated. Even the names of the publishing houses, I look at Dar al Hurriya you know, like Freedom Press, um, kind of uh, even these kinds of, uh, but of course it's not the freedom that we know, it's the yeah. freedom yeah. of fascism, yeah. So um, you look at them and then afterwards what happened was because the, it's all to do with oil prices and that's why you get this expansion in the 1970s of the, of the publishing sector and other cultural sectors. And then suddenly publications for women during the 80s and 90s suddenly they're not priority anymore, for example, and then kind of, you know, publications for the military are more important. So I look at actually, I do a statistical analysis of um, publications, especially during the Iran-Iraq mm. war, because it makes no sense logistically why certain books are more pub published, uh, other than the fact that it's propaganda and ideology driving it all. So thank you for that. I, I'm glad everyone's interested in Vincent Hoda because yes, um, yeah. yeah, I only look at one one novel and then look at other novelists. Yeah, I mean, I have her entire, um, I have an, I have her entire collection. Um, it's been published several several times, but I mean, I have I have them all here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, before I go to a question about the role of the you know exiled um iraqi in in the sense of the uh, of that what party that were in iran i wanted to ask you about um a, a translation industry i know that in iran the um after i mean probably again there was a shell shock after the revolution and it was a very brief period before the war started and um but the uh hunger for translation and the range of material. And for the first time, you know, it's not just looking to Europe, it's all over the world from, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, 
all uh, those and you know the range of yeah, yeah, tra uh, translation is of big in Iran. <laughs> no, in novels and that in a way does direct i mean it opens up the eyes of the indigenous authors as well to perhaps same predicaments you know the atrocities in a state whether you're from you know chile or iraq or iran or you know um uh, south africa or what with certain things it's it's at the heart of it the same brutality the same use of sexual violence as a weapon of war etc i mean we know that so what is that is there a support for it is it good are they good translations are they um popular reading them yeah thank you for that question i actually look at uh, translations from arabic into other languages mm -hmm. and from english into um into arabic yeah. so you find that again during the iran iraq war when iraq wanted to gain international kind of support you get a lot of translations from arabic into english but then in the 1970s, when I talked about the translation of um, popular romances, because these women had just learned to read, suddenly you've had just lots of people who know how to read. So yeah. there were a lot of, and not enough materials in Arabic. Remember, this is a poetry based, yeah. like Iran as well, like a poetry based mm. society, and very late with the novel. And so even as a genre, it was so exciting to have these novels. And, and that's why Bint al Huda thought that she had to write kind of authentic Arabic novels for her society rather than import them. Mm. A novel that was very popular actually, and I have, <laughs> it was Les Miserables actually uh, by yeah. Victor Hugo, yeah. and I think it's the same in Iran as well. Mm. I don't know why, uh, every, it was such a, uh, everyone references it. Yeah. Uh, Bint al Huda references it. Everyone references mm -hmm. that novel. Um, yes. And everyone obviously claims to be on the side of the, um, of of course, the oppressed yeah. and the yeah. downtrodden. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yes, but during the 1990s, unfortunately, no cultural, very little cultural production because of, we all know, but mm, even about the, the lack yeah. of paper from sanctions, the effect on you know, of the yeah. sanctions. So Absolutely. no translations and very yeah. little production, but a lot of exile literature because suddenly the state kind of quiets. There's no bombarding from the state discursively. And, and that's why other voices were able to emerge even outside Iraq, but people were still scared to write course, even outside absolutely. Iraq. They're not, and sometimes it's not the priority. So yes. not to not to forget about our Facebook audience. Um, uh, there is a question. Well, there's a question will take us onto another lecture, but you might like to point on it. Can you talk a bit about the rise of communism and communist era in Iraq? But perhaps I think that could be that. Uh, obviously, it had that era. Whether literary production and whether. Uh, you know, the communists are supposed to be egalitarian and really not distinguish uh, between genders, etc. perhaps promote writing by women. That, um, uh, if you could have a moment to answer that. And there's another Facebook question that, is there a difference in the narratives of Iraqi women before and after the campaign of faith? Is that, am I doing yes, it right? Faith campaign, faith yes, faith campaign yes. during the 1990s. So perhaps, you know, focusing on the era of um, the communist era of writing. I think there's a lot of interest now in communist writing. I think a lot of people are interested in the Communist Party, even the history of the Party in Iran as well. A lot of people yeah, are interested very, in the communists. Yeah. Um, I think what happens is that because, I mean, at the time when people asked me about the Ba'ath Party and how the Ba'ath Party, you know, just the word Ba'ath is enough to um, uh, just, you know, this, people have such a visceral reaction because mm. of the historical experience. But if you look back at the intentions and the what was, you know, what the bath was supposed to stand for at the time, it, it, I, you know, I don't think anyone could have envisioned like the horror that could have come out of it. And I think a lot of our interest in the Communist Party is a sense of nostalgia, is a sense of possibly it would have been something else, it would have been different. And I love um, Haifa Zengana's book because she says, we don't know we could have worn the faces of the oppressors. We could have been that. Maybe if we had taken power, we'd have been the same. And this is this has been actually, and I think this has been vindicated in the way that history has unfolded in Iraq. So, uh, you know, the, the, the oppressed become the oppressor and who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed and what happens when marginalized communities take power? How, would, how do they deal with taking power after being, and that's the fear I think that we have of revolution in, in, in the Middle East generally is that, we don't know. We claim the moral high ground, but we don't know. 
what we yeah. could have done. And that's why I think we're interested in the communists and we like to think that the communists would have done things differently. Mm -hmm. But really, do we want to look at some communist experiences in other countries <laughs> and, and, to, and to look at how that, yeah. that unfolded? Yes. I, think, I, don't, I don't think that anyone has the claim to the moral high ground, the communists, the, 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 you know, the, the Islamists, the, no one has yeah. the, the moral high ground, yeah. unfortunately. Exactly. And about the narratives of women before and after the faith campaign? The faith campaign. Yeah. Well, for, for religious women, I don't think the faith, the religious Shia women, the faith campaign had no no effect because it, it was this, you know, they had their own sub discourse, kind of like a sub discourse that had a religious discourse that was um, uh, kind of detached from the state because mm -hmm. they saw the state discourse on religion as being hypocritical. Uh, so it didn't really affect them. But um, and as for um, other women who weren't maybe religious Shia women, I felt like there was actually a uh, kind of a reaction against. So if you look That's at Baghdad diaries, it's all about, she talks about um, getting on a bike and driving down and then everyone looking at her in a way as in like, why, why is she on a bike? And she flaunts that, that she can ride a bike, um, for example. So I feel like actually you get a resistance. I don't feel, I haven't read any religious uh, novels written by non-Shia women. Yeah, if there are yeah, any, please yeah. send them to me. Yeah, <laughs> well, I don't yeah think exactly. That well. they, yeah, it wouldn't dare send you perhaps in the country, maybe in the. <laughs> I think you have a lot of Shia writers because it, it it was a it was a political tool used very early early on. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, to combat the kind yeah. of the secularism of the bath, but generally, I don't I don't see any kind of religious novels written by. Um, no. Being affected by the faith campaign, no, not at yeah. all. And then we have a question um, uh, from Noah Madloum, who asks about the um, role of the Al Dawa party and the fact that they uh, settled in Iran. And, and for the other uh, um, audience, this is the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, which uh, uh, spent most of its time in exile in Iran. And obviously, the support of the Iranian supreme leader, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini and thereafter. And so did they, I mean, did they re, uh, import back to the Iraqi literary scene? And this question particularly talks about poetry and novels. And this was um, uh, because they were away from um, the rule of, of Saddam Hussein in Iran, did they explore ideas or came things that then it had, it, it returned to Iraq and had another, uh, had an influence on the domestic production. I don't think that um, it was their priority at all. And remember, literature exactly. is not a priority for most, actually, as I said, uh, literature, especially the novel, because of Bint al-Huda, was associated with women mm -hmm. writing stories. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually um, encountered any writings by religious men. Um, so I don't think it was seen as a priority. I think mm -hmm. that politic kind of direct, whether be it propaganda or direct kind of political works, yes. pamphlets and other types of literature were the priority and not um, not the writing of novel. And I think that's, that's what makes Vidhuda quite unique. I think that um, it, for her to recognize um, that the novel could be used, um, and and it was then by the state, adopted by the state during the Iran-Iraq yes. war, she was aware yeah. of it. But then I don't think that, um, yeah, I don't think that the Dao party- And it wasn't, so there wasn't that, oh, now that they didn't fear Saddam Hussein, I suppose, you know, would they um, write, I am not, wait, correct me, absolutely, uh, that any novels by, you know, by women, by Iraqi women living in, um, uh, Exile, for want of a better word, in Iran, being published necessarily in Iran, or, or it had been, it might have actually been used for you know double propaganda. Because I think, although they were in Iran, but perhaps considering that they would have freedom of expression is a little bit um, unrealistic. They were still on now under the uh, uh, the Shi'i rule in Iran. I suppose it's not. A, but I, are you aware of these other? exiled writing no i would love to know if there were iraqi iran. women writing in farsi for example or yeah, writing in arabic in iran yes. i don't think so and then i don't I, and the way i try to find these texts is i don't just look at um obviously western libraries it's quite yes. hard to find these things mm. but if you come from a certain background you know that yes. if if the if 
that book would have been pop popular, I probably would have known about it. I mean, yes. the books that I, I've actually had um, books. So there is an anthology of women, of Arab women's writing by mm -hmm. Radwa Ashur and Fari Al Ghazul. Amazing. It's just an anthology of Arab women writers. So mm -hmm. um, alphabetically, and I searched through that because I wanted to know if I could see if I could find some you know other writers. Um, yeah. She only lists three uh, religious uh, writers, mm -hmm. an Iraqi Kuwaiti, a uh, Kuwaiti of Iraqi origin, and I, I discuss her, and then a, a third novelist uh, who is still alive, and I've searched high and low for you, Maida Rabay, if you are there somewhere, <laughs> I need to read your work. I can't find your novels, I can't yeah. find anything. But the ones that I found that were not written in that anthology, mm -hmm. I found in the private collections um, in my hometown in Saudi Arabia. So I just said, okay, guys, do you remember those old novels that we yeah. used that, that were really popular at, at the time in the 90s? Do you guys have any? And I've discovered new authors uh, through uh, actually my connections here. Yeah, so, it's good. Yeah, 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 so that's how I found them. That's how you, that's how you find popular literature. You're not going to find popular literature e easily in, um, in a normal library. And I've had no, people actually no. in Iraq search for books for me. I was like, can you find these books in Iraq? Because nowadays we have so many, just, just the level, the literacy, not the literacy level as in reading and writing. We have discerning readers now in the Arab world. It's not like when, when we yeah. first started reading, like now people will not settle. People really are good novel readers yes. Um, yes. in a way that yeah. they weren't before. So you either write something really good or it will not take off. We just, uh, yes, yeah. I was thinking that it is actually Okay, you might have a page turner and you may have a, something that, you know, it's sort of a one week, one month, one year wonder. But in terms of the uh, power, the literary power, I mean, are they beautifully written? Obviously, I would, the book said you recommended, you know, I'll read it in, um, uh, in English translation. But the power of the Arabic discourse that you use, I mean, are, are these books that, will endure and there will be absolutely beautiful in terms of a literary piece of writing yes definitely those no so i think edward said actually talks about um uh, the baghdad diaries and he said mm -hmm. that this is the only text that i felt really reflected real life um mm -hmm. it was either edward said or Mahmoud Darwish. i'm very sorry i think it was edward said who talked about um Nuharadi's book yeah. um as being like very authentic and 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 um, it's the best text he could find about sanctions in Iraq and how they affected real people. And for me, Dunya Mikhail's uh, book is, is, that, that's is interesting. and it's destined yeah. to endure. And yeah. um, of course, the, the, the other texts, I mean, the, the religious texts will endure only because yeah. the author died in such a gruesome way and represented yes. something. Yeah. But I think that even young Shia girls now will not read them. They were for a specific generation, that's for right. a specific type of time. Yes. Um, and that's why I wanted to include those, you know, I, I didn't want people to be left with the idea that this is what Iraq produces. Iraq yes, is just, yeah. one of the richest literary absolutely. traditions in the world. Good, so. good heavens, absolutely. That's why one sometimes seeing this lull, okay, it might be, it's, it's a shell shock <laughs> because no. the, the value as a, as a literature. And I think maybe we have one last question, a, a member of audience on the Facebook who's joined us very late and wonders, and I don't think you did this, that um, did you touch upon the graphic novel at all in Iraq? She, so he or she says, I'm sorry I missed the beginning. Was the graphic graphic novel used at all? I mean, I know this is a new genre in Iran too. They did genre. like the, you know, like Persepolis and that sort of idea of, um, but I don't know, does, is that, um, I'm just sure what they mean. I'm sure, not sure whether I understand by graphic novel do they mean that literally, or whether graphic in its uh, depiction of in its depiction? Details. Yeah, <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah, it's not clear, but yeah. yeah, you've you've got them. It's happening. I don't know in Iraq specifically, but um, as you say, like it's like graphic novels are becoming yeah. more um, yeah. more popular in in the Arab world generally. But they weren't. It wasn't the case at the time uh, in the in the historical period that I look at. I think that we have become more visual. Um, with time because of technology and whatever and we we, we feel like we need these novels appeal to us but people yeah. were much more um willing to sit down and read a, just a, a, a boring book with no pictures if that's what the gra if, if that's the graphic novel yes kind of or as she's talking person, about yeah i know because i know that i mean you know it's so hard in iran books have been published and it show, just shows the magic of the author's pen and the power of imagination 
that you forget sometimes is you know a very romantic novel or whether this could be talk about a, a passionate extramarital affair etc that you know obviously the certain things which are a no-go area like iranian cinema mm -hmm. but you forget that they are written in such a way that you very soon you forget that there are restrictions in what you can describe or detail and when there is no touch where it's nothing you know you cannot embrace a, a heartbroken a member of the opposite sex but yet it's somehow so much power yeah. to in the restraint. absolutely yeah. and you don't need to spell out uh things so it's really i th i've actually no idea when we stop but maybe aki would probably suddenly you know cut us both off if we go on and uh it's really, it's been such a pleasure. Uh, Hurajan, Dr. Al Hassan, it's so lovely to back you at. Uh, thank you so uh, much for having me. Thank you to everyone who attended. Oh, so, and so, so wonderful to hear about that. This is just the beginning of the journey and the other projects that you have in mind and bringing uh, a more, you know, comparative element to across the regions, across languages of the region. So certain issues that you're interested in are not just confined to one uh, yeah. linguistic family or one um, tribe or country or nation. So it's really wonderful. We wish you absolutely all the best and delighted and grateful that Thank you, you so much. It was, it was great. It was great. Thank you and so we're much. Really, and our lovely audience, again, thank you so much for being with us. And we look forward to uh seeing you next week so we obviously we crisscross the region we crisscross disciplines and ideas to talk so um i hope you'll be back with us next tuesday where we are uh going to look again we, we are not far from iraq going across the border to iran and looking at china's engagement and relations uh, with Iran. And Professor Anush Ehtashami from the based at Durham University will be uh, talking about the um, Middle East, West Asia, the Asianizations. And again, this is very topical, especially as we heard over the weekend about the Chinese aggressive uh, efforts in creating another a trade block. So do please join us again. We'd be delighted to have you. We always welcome your um, thoughts, your uh, please email us and um, stay in touch and very much looking forward to having you. And please stay safe and well. And um, we wish you happiness and uh, of joy in these socially distant times. And please join me in saying good night to Hura John, Hura Dr. Um, Hura Al Hassan, and um, look forward to having you back with uh, greetings and farewell from SOAS University of London. Good night. <laughs>